To understand and improve memory, you need to learn about all these topics on the slide. To illustrate one of these examples, forgetting curves, how many of the topics on the previous slide do you think you could remember now? Well, try to remember these terms. Did you remember as many terms as you predicted? You might have remembered about four to five of the topics now, and in an hour, you might only remember about three of these topics, and tomorrow you might remember only two of these topics, and by next week, you might remember none of these topics, if you're lucky. Unsurprisingly, memories tend to subside over time, called the forgetting curve. This forgetting curve is often steeper than we predict. In only a couple of days, the number of topics you remember, or the likelihood that you remember a specific concept, could even halve, and therefore subside faster than you might expect. However, the forgetting curve is not always so steep. If you learn the material well, the curve is not as steep. You can remember most of the art terms. But how well do you need to learn the material? One recommendation is to learn the material one day, then revise the material one day later, one week later, and one month later. And if you follow this advice, you're more likely to be able to retain these memories indefinitely. But what are the causes of forgetting? Why do we forget the material we learn? Well, several explanations have been proposed. First, we might never have transferred the material into long-term memory. And to clarify, the material we learn is initially retained in working memory, a structure in the brain that retains information for a few seconds or minutes. And some of this information is then transferred into long-term memory called consolidation. And information that's transferred into long-term memory can be retained indefinitely. And information that's not transferred into long-term memory will thus vanish in the next few days, hours, or even minutes. And this material will be forgotten. So how can you shift information from working memory into long-term memory? Well, you can apply a variety of strategies to shift or consolidate these memories. For example, you can first retrieve other information about this topic. So to illustrate, suppose you learn that cheetahs actually meow. Now to memorize this information, you could first retrieve your previous knowledge about this topic, such as you know, cheetahs run fast, and cheetahs are seldom aggressive to humans, and that domestic cats meow. You could then relate the information you need to learn with this past knowledge. You could note that cheetahs meow like domestic cats, and also exhibit similar levels of aggression to domestic cats. Now, material that is connected to past knowledge is more likely to be transferred to long-term memory. That is, this material is more likely to be consolidated. Now, other strategies can also shift information from working memory to long-term memory. First, if you reflect upon a topic on several distinct occasions, information from working memory is more likely to be transferred to long-term memory. Second, if you reflect upon the underlying meaning instead of the superficial features of some topic, consolidation is more likely. If you think about why cheetahs might meow, it's quite a deep concept, you're more likely to remember this information later. Whereas if you merely think about how the phrase cheetahs meow sounds like cheetahs are allowed, a more superficial thought, you're not as likely to remember this information later. And third, deep sleep enhances the consolidation of facts, whereas REM sleep enhances the consolidation of skills. Now, sometimes, however, people seem to forget information they had known previously. In other words, even information that seems to have been consolidated in long-term memory can be forgotten. So how is this information forgotten? Well, one possibility is the information is stored in long-term memory, but can't be retrieved. As an analogy, Imagine that you need to locate a book in the library. However, now imagine the book was never assigned a reference number, barcode, or any cue that could help you locate the book. So the book is in the library somewhere, but virtually impossible to retrieve. Similarly, some of the information we learn, such as foreign words or math formulas, are hard to retrieve. Of course, we never assign barcodes or references to the information we learn. That is, regardless of how often I zap my brain with a barcode reader, my memory doesn't seem to improve. 
But actually, we do connect the information we learn to cues and hints that could facilitate retrieval. To illustrate, suppose you meet someone called Dick Sprout, and suppose his nose resembles part of his name. And more specifically, I mean, suppose his nose resembles a sprout. So your memory of his name, Dick Sprout, is somehow connected to the memory that his nose resembles a sprout. So in the future, when you see his nose, you're likely to remember his name. That is, the memory that his nose resembles a sprout is activated or energized when you see him. And this image then activates and is connected to the memory of his name. Now, this example illustrates the notion of retrieval cues. And in long-term memory, the material we learn is often stored alongside other cues or images. Reminders of these cues or images will activate the material that we learned. So to memorize the material we learn, we should connect this information to suitable cues or hints. Cues or hints that we're likely to remember later. Yet even um, this information may be forgotten. In particular, according to the notion of interference, Recent material could interfere with our capacity to retrieve past material. So to illustrate, suppose we first learn the name of Dick Sprout, and then we learn the name of someone else whose nose also resembles a sprout, is called Russell Sprout. Now when we see Dick Sprout and his nose that resembles a sprout, the name Russell Sprout is likely to spring into our mind. After all, we met Russell Sprout more recently, and so his name might be more prominent to us. And this example illustrates how learning recent material can impede the retrieval of previous information. After we learn the name Russell Sprout, our capacity to retrieve the name Dick Sprout deteriorated. Now, the explanations thus far imply that information is transferred to long-term memory lasts indefinitely, but may not always be retrievable. Yet another possibility is that some information in long-term memory might actually decay in some way over time. After several months, years, or decades, the memory traces of this information in our brain may be too sort of faint to retrieve. As an analogy, memories in long-term memory might be like the paint on a wooden cottage that gradually fades over time. Now, some research indicates, however, that such decay is probably overestimated. So to illustrate, suppose you learn the name of a person called Bumblestick, and one year later, you might be asked to recall the name of this person. You might initially maintain that you don't know the name of this person, but then after you receive a clue, such as Bumble, you might say in triumph, actually, I remember now, his name is Bumblestick. Now, in this example, you could not retrieve this information without a clue. That is, you could not freely recall the name. However, you could retrieve the information after you received the clue or cue, sometimes called cued recall. And this simple example shows how information that seems to have delayed or decayed or vanished may actually be stored in memory. But because the memory may have decayed in some way, more clues or cues are needed to activate this memory again. Now suppose that 10 years later, you're again prompted to recall the name of this person. And this time, even with the clue Bumble, you might be unable to remember the name. You might therefore assume that perhaps the name has now vanished from memory. But actually, when asked to mutter the first name that just enters your head, you might actually utter Bumblestick. In other words, you can't explicitly remember that his name is Bumblestick. That is, your explicit memory is impaired, but your behavior implies that you have retained this name. Otherwise, you're unlikely to have uttered Bumblestick. That is, you exhibit what is called implicit memory of this name. Indeed, people with Alzheimer's disease, um, a disease that usually begins with impairments in memory, often in older age, tend to exhibit impaired explicit memory, but not always impaired implicit memory, at least early in the disease. For example, they might forget the names of individuals, but actually quite often guess these names correctly. So what is the cause of Alzheimer's disease? Well, although this topic is contentious, most researchers believe that Alzheimer's disease can at least partly be described to an unhealthy lifestyle. Smoking, drugs, alcohol, physical activity, unhealthy food, stress, 
and depression, and I should have mentioned physical inactivity, not physical activity, can actually damage the blood-brain barrier and elicit a series of problems in the brain. And these problems can damage parts of the brain that are vital to memory, such as a region called the hippocampus. And this damage to these regions, such as the hippocampus, underpins many of the features that characterise Alzheimer's disease, especially the memory problems. Now recently in Holland, as well as some other nations, organisations have developed communities or villages that are designed to please individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So one example is a village called Hoggerwake. And all of the stores and infrastructure in this village comprised products and services these individuals utilised when they were younger. Products and services that are very familiar to these individuals. And even all the apartments comprise furniture and appliances that are also familiar to these individuals. And as a consequence, the individuals feel safer and their anxiety subsides and their behaviour can improve as well. Now, these villages are effective partly because individuals with Alzheimer's disease, especially during the early phases, tend to remember their past. They remember their schools and friends, their houses, rituals, and indeed most of their previous past life. Instead, they initially are unable to generate new memories. So they can't learn new names, new instructions, or new topics. And this tendency is called anterior grade amnesia amnesia of the future. However, after some accidents, people sometimes forget past memories as well, even memories that were quite entrenched and consolidated, a problem that's often depicted in movies. So they might forget their family or even their name, although they typically can retain their skills. Now this problem is called retrograde amnesia, or forgetting about the past, but it's typically only temporary. Now, retrograde amnesia can also be ascribed to damage to the hippocampus, as well as other regions, such as the temporal lobes. Yet, a few individuals actually experience the opposite problem called hypothymesia, and they actually remember everything. They can recall almost every experience in their life in detail, such as every food they've eaten for breakfast in the past, the clothes their friends were wearing throughout their life, and even every TV episode they watched. And these memories sometimes seem quite overwhelming. That is, these memories often flood their awareness and compromise their concentration. Um, arguably, this problem can often be ascribed to very strong connections between the hippocampus, um, a structure vital to memory, and the amygdala, the region that underpins fear. But interestingly, this hypothymesia is not really entirely beneficial, but actually it can be quite disconcerting for the individuals. Individuals with hypothymesia actually tend to experience high levels of distress, implying that almost perfect memory can actually be problematic.